I now have the great honor of introducing our distinguished commencement speaker, Amy Goodman. Jan journalist and author Amy Goodman is known for her commitment to transparency and truth in reporting. She is the host and executive producer of Democracy Now!, a national independent award-winning daily news program airing on over 900 television and radio stations in North America. She's author of four New York Times bestsellers and writes a nationally syndicated weekly column. Ms. Goodman grew up on Long Island. After graduating from Harvard in 1984 with a degree in anthropology, she spent 10 years as producer of the evening news show at WBAI, Pacifica Radio, Stations, radio Station in New York City. In 1996, Amy Goodman created Democracy Now!, for which she was the first journalist to receive the Right Livelihood Award, widely known as the Alternative Nobel Prize. As the only national radio and TV news show free of all corporate underwriting, Democracy Now! presents a range of independent voices not often heard on the airwaves. In Goodman's own words, dissent is what makes this country healthy. And her program gives space to that dissent. Goodman's work has been widely recognized. Time Magazine named Democracy Now! one of its, quote, pick of the podcasts. In 2007, she won the Gracie Award for individual achievement in public broadcasting for a public broadcasting host from American Women in Radio and Television. And she was the 2006 recipient of the Puffin Nation Prize for Creative Citizenship. She was also one of the first recipients of the Park Center for Independent Media's Izzy Award, named for the great muckraking journalist I.F. Stone. Both Goodman's daily reporting and her groundbreaking work in Nigeria and East Timor have won numerous awards, including the George Polk Award, the Robert F. Kennedy Prize for International Reporting, and the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia Award. She's also received awards from the Associated Press, United Press International, and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. She received the first ever Communication for Peace Award from the World Association for Christian Communication and was also honored by the National Council of Teachers of English with the George Orwell Award for a distinguished contribution to honesty and clarity in public language. The Independent of London called Amy Goodman and Democracy Now! quote, an inspiration, and Pulse named her one of the 20 top global media figures in 2009. Please join me in welcoming Amy Goodman. What an honor it is to be here with all of you, and congratulations to the graduates. Well, we came up this morning in the pouring rain, fierce rain. Yes, we live in a time of global warming. The extremes in Vermont alone tell us so much. In the last months, the highest precipitation on record the highest levels in Lake Champlain on record. So I was very relieved when I came here to Vermont Law School, not only the finest environmental law school in the country, but the fact you have compost toilets in the Oaks Building was very inspiring. The fact that it has um, platinum LEED certification. That's the top environmental certification that the US Green Building Council gives. And I come from New York, from Democracy Now!, where we also just built the greenest internet radio TV studios in the country and got platinum leads. So it's wonderful to come to a sister institution that deeply believes that the medium is the message. And to come to a state that is a land of so many firsts, among them, the Vermont legislature, the first to bestow upon itself the right to determine the future of its own nuclear power plant. The only state in the country to be able to do this. 
basically to put environmental policy in the hands of the people. That's, I think, what you study here at Vermont Law School, how, how to carry that forward. And as I came here in the pouring rain, I thought about what a difference it would make if the meteorolo meteorologists we see on television, like the weathermen and women who um, give us the weather, what we all tune into on all the networks, on all the radio stations, you know, on the TV, how it flashes in the lower third, extreme weather, severe weather. And this is important. This is what we need to know when we have to put on our mud boots. Um, but what if they flashed also two other words? Climate change, global warming. Because there actually is something we can do about the weather. We can pursue a different energy course in this country. And I think that's what many of you are going to be the leaders in. And as I came here, I thought about nuclear policy and how it connects us to the rest of the world. How what we're seeing in Japan today, one of the greatest nuclear catastrophes in history, has such relevance for us in this country. And also a lesson about independent journalism. We need a media that is not brought to us by the oil companies, the gas companies, not brought to us by the coal companies or the nuclear companies, but brought to us by listeners and viewers all over the country and world who are deeply committed to a free and honest and open discourse among peoples. No corporations are not in fact people, which is why some laws must be changed. But Let's go back to the dawn of the nuclear age because Japan is right at ground zero there. The only country in the world to be the target of two nuclear bombs, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A very important story about the journalists who covered that period. It was 1945. General MacArthur put the whole area of South Japan off limits once the bombs were dropped. Most reporters went off the coast of Japan to cover the Japanese surrender. But there was an independent reporter, Wilfred Burchett, who said, no, I need to see with my own eyes, what does it mean, the dawn of the nuclear age? What does it look like? And so he got on a train and rode for 30 hours. And when he got out in Hiroshima, he was a war correspondent. He was a veteran of coverage of wars all over the world. But he had never seen anything like this, a man-made moonscape that had once been a city. People running with the skin melting off their skin, shadows of people ingrained in the remaining buildings. And he sat down in the rubble with his Hermes typewriter, and he tapped out the words, I write this as a warning to the world. This rocked the War Department in the United States. It wasn't called the Pentagon at the time. It wasn't called the Defense Department, as it has now come to be known, but the War Department. And they well, had some media at their disposal that was very powerful. They had the New York Times. William Lawrence wrote a series of articles. He was a New York Times writer, also on the payroll of the Pentagon of the War Department. He was writing the press releases for Secretary Stimson, extolling the virtues of the nuclear bomb, how remarkable it was. The Times had a headline, no radiation found at Hiroshima. When Wilfred Burchett was writing, he didn't even have the language to say there's some kind of atomic sickness here. Wilfred, William Lawrence wrote a series of 10 pieces and he won a Pulitzer Prize for his reporting. The first embedded reporter. I think the time should be stripped of that Pulitzer. It is so critical that we have a media that is independent and also important to understand the power of a media that makes neighbors of those very distant from us just by letting people speak for themselves. You know, the Secretary of War at the time was Secretary Stimson, and when he was handed the list of the nuclear targets, the bomb targets, he had to choose two. He saw Hiroshima, he saw Nagasaki, he saw Kyoto. And he 
struck Kyoto off the list because he said, my wife and I have been there, a beautiful city. We've known the people, the landmarks. And he took it off the list. How unfortunate that the people of Hiroshima or Nagasaki had not gotten to host the Stimsons. But there is a deep, profound lesson in that. If you know someone, you are less likely to want to hurt them. And that's the power of independent media. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day. War and peace, life and death. And anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country because they can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us and civilian society to have the discussions that will lead to the decisions about whether they live or die, whether they are sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society. There is nothing more profound than hearing a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, an aunt in Iraq or an uncle in Afghanistan describe what it feels like to be at the target end. Reporters all too often, especially embedded reporters, report from the trigger end. And it's important when we make decisions that determine the fate of the earth, that we see the effect of our policy, the United States, the most powerful country on earth, from all sides. Which is why I was so deeply concerned about what happened at the Republican Convention in St. Paul in 2008 when over 40 reporters, journalists, photographers, videographers were arrested as they covered the protests in the streets. I was among them along with my colleagues at Democracy Now!, Sharif Abdul and Nicole Salazar. It was the first day of the convention and it was gonna begin in the afternoon. It was September 1st, it was Labor Day. It was a beautiful blue sky day. It was a Monday. In the morning, a mass protest was held from the St. Paul uh, City Hall to the Excel Center where the convention was taking place. And the protest was led by soldiers, a number in uniform, and they were in risking a lot to be there. Some who had served, others who had refused to serve, saying no to war. And thousands of people across the political spectrum marched with them, as they had at the Democratic Convention in Denver as well. And they marched to the Excel Center. We were covering them. I then went off to the convention center to interview the delegates, uh, especially from the hottest state at the time, from Alaska. And my colleagues went to digitize tape. Nicole and Sharif in the TV studio we were broadcasting from, and they heard a commotion outside, they ran outside, there were riot police, there were protesters, Nicole was filming, Sharif was holding the microphone. And all I know is that I got a call on the floor of the convention that I better come quickly to 7th and Jackson because they were being arrested and they were being hurt. I raced off the floor of the convention center down to this parking lot where the riot police had surrounded the area and contained it. I knew I just had to get our reporters out. I had all my credentials on that give me national security clearance to interview presidents and vice presidents and delegates. And I ran up to the riot police and I said very quickly, you can see I'm an accredited journalist. My two colleagues also have the same credentials. They're inside, we need to have them released. It wasn't seconds before the riot police ripped me through the line, twisted my arms back, slapped the handcuffs on, pushed me up against the wall and onto the ground. I was arrested, the misdemeanor interfering with a peace officer, if only there was a peace officer in the vicinity. I was demanding to find Sharif and Nicole to be, for, to be brought to them. I couldn't see Nicole, I saw Sharif across the parking lot. I was finally brought to him, his arm was bleeding, he was handcuffed as well. We were saying, you must release us, we're journalists. We are here to cover these protests, whereupon the Secret Service came and ripped our credentials from around our necks. I was brought into the police wagon. There was Nicole. She described what happened when she went down to film with Sharif. The riot police were coming at her, and as they were shouting, on your face, she was shouting back as she was filming, not planning to film her own violent arrest. Press, press, showing her press pass as she held up her camera and filmed. And they came at her, and they fiercely pushed her down on the ground, knee or boot in her back, She's on her face and they're pulling on her legs so they're bloodying her face. And the first thing they did with the camera was take the battery out if you were wondering what they wanted to stop happening. They wanted the filming of what was happening to stop happening. I was brought to the police garage where they erected cages for the protesters and Sharif and Nicole were brought off to jail. Now, it was because of grassroots response that we were eventually released that night. 
I mean, there were thousands of calls that came in. It's the power of independent media. The YouTube video of uh, our arrests went up online immediately. It became, went viral, the most watched YouTube video of the Republican convention for the first two days. And it released us, first me, then Nicole and Sharif. Sharif was in jail with the AP photographer. And it showed the power of the response because... Sharif got out and the AP photographer did not get out at that moment. I was brought then back to the convention center. All the networks wanted to interview me. I was in the NBC skybox. When the interview was done, an NBC producer came up to me and said, I don't get it. Why wasn't I arrested? I said, oh, were you outside covering the protest? He said, no. So I said, well, this is the thing. I'm not getting arrested in the skybox either. <laughs> um, as Woody Allen says, 90% of life is just showing up. You know, you got to get out there. And this is very, very important. Because think of young reporters who are sent by their editors to cover the convention. If they think they'll go outside and get arrested, as more than 40 reporters were, they're not going to risk it. It's not only a violation of freedom of the press, but a violation of the public's right to know. We shouldn't have to get a record when we put things on the record. And so my colleagues and I have sued the... Uh, federal and state authorities, the police and Minneapolis, St. Paul, because it is such a critical point. Your right to know determines policy in this country. Information is power, and we have to protect the free flow of that information. It's also such an honor to be here in this state that has the first legislature to pass a marriage equality law. You have something very, to, very important to be proud of. And just a few years ago when that debate took place in the Vermont legislature, how humbled we all were. I was in Tennessee when we interviewed a 12-year-old girl named Evan Orlick Jetter. You may remember her testifying before the Vermont legislature. Um, she said, I'm 12 years old, I live in Bedford Center, I have a wonderful family. I live with my little brother, my grandma, my two moms, who are with me all the time and support me in whatever I do. I love them very much, and I wish that having to stand up here right now in front of this committee wasn't an issue anymore. She said, we need to reach the promised land. Vermont's freedom to marry can help us get back on track. That's what she testified before the Vermont legislature, before they passed the Freedom to Marry Act, the governor vetoed it, and the legislature overturned that veto. We were in Tennessee broadcasting Democracy Now! from Eastern Tennessee University on that day, and we had Evan on by satellite. And I asked her, how do you feel, Evan? 12 years old, and she looked up into the camera and said, I feel honored that I could help change history. It was really a big moment for me. <laughs> and it just made me think of the great anthropologist Margaret Mead, who said, never doubt for a moment that a small group of committed people can change the world. In fact, it's the only thing that ever has, she said. Yes, what a difference. A small person or a large group of people can make. And what a difference Vermont Law School has made. So moving to hear Dean Shields talk about the ground you have broken when it comes to standing up for gay men and lesbians. Only two schools in the country to have done so, and paid for it dearly in financial funds being lost from the federal government, but much more dear are your principles and how you have preserved them for everyone, for equality for everyone. Which makes me think of another Vermont first, the first state constitution to abolish slavery. What a proud history Vermont has. Frederick Douglass and his early tours in the Northeast came through Vermont. And that made me think of the story of Frederick Douglass. You know, I was invited on CNN after President Obama was elected. It was actually before he was president, but after his election. And it was this historic moment. Michelle and Barack Obama were going to go into the White House and meet the Bushes before Inauguration Day. So they had me in to talk about the significance of this. And there was a round table of people, and they were chattering about this and about that. It, 
you ever think about the networks and what they represent and how they should be challenged? What we see on all the networks, that small circle of pundits who know so little about so much, explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. <laughs> so there we were, sitting in CNN studios, and they were saying something, and I saw the Obamas walking into the White House. They asked me something else, and I said, no, no, we just have to take pause. Barack Hussein Obama and Michelle LaVon Robinson Obama, she is the descendant of slaves, which means their daughters are the descendants of slaves. In this land with a history of slavery, will soon live in the White House, the most famous house on earth that is built by slaves. We must just take pause. And it made me think of a house not so far from the White House, a couple of, mile, a couple of hours away on the eastern shore of Maryland. See, Frederick Douglass was born on the eastern shore of Maryland. He was enslaved as a youth and a teenager. He became the greatest abolitionist this country has ever known. Uh, and it might not surprise you to know that he was a troublesome slave. And he was handed over to a man named Edward Covey, who was called the Slave Breaker. Edward Covey's property was Mount Misery, and it was there that Frederick Douglass was beaten, was tortured, but he broke away, headed north, and changed the world. In fact, when he was in New York, when he first escaped, I go to this little organic coffee shop in downtown Manhattan, old brick building, it's got a plaque and it says, this was the printing press of David Ruggles, a free black man born in Connecticut. It was the place where Frederick Douglass first took refuge when he came north. David Ruggles had a printing press. Frederick Douglass founded the North Star newspaper. You see, media is so important. Information is power. These men saw it as their form of liberation. You know, Mount Misery today in St. Michael's, Maryland is owned by Donald Rumsfeld. He bought it in 2003 when he was Secretary of Defense to be near his close friend, Vice President Cheney. Yes, Donald Rumsfeld owns Mount Misery. So I was so shocked by learning this, you know, reading architectural stories about it, reading historical accounts. I thought, I got to get down there. So I went with my colleague Dennis Moynihan down to Maryland before I started actually talking about it in speeches like these. And I thought, oh my gosh, how are we gonna find out where the Secretary of Defense lives? We had like an hour to be there. And I saw an organic coffee shop ahead of us in St. Michael's, I thought, they'll tell the truth. You can see a theme in my life. So I ran into the coffee shop, I said, excuse me, they said, what, can we, um, what would you like? And I said, I'd like to know where Donald Rumsfeld lives. And they said, oh, just go out the road, um, you'll hit Mount Pleasant Road, don't go down that road, make a right and another right, you'll hit Mount Misery Road, go down the road, and that's where he lives. So we went down the road, didn't go down Mount Pleasant, took a right and another right. It seems we couldn't go right enough. And uh, at the end of that road, we saw the black tinted windows of the SUV of the Secret Service and we knew we'd arrived. So I got out quickly and I have my video camera and I'm zooming in as they're zooming out. And I'm thinking, does Donald Rumsfeld understand the significance of where he lives? But sure enough, my camera lands on this stake in the ground next to the driveway and it says Mount Misery. And so we head off to this old black church at Sunday morning. The folks are just about to have mass. It was an ancient church. And they were in the um, sanctuary. And I went up to an older woman. I said, excuse me, I just wanted to ask you about the historic place you live in. I mean, here, Frederick Douglass was born. He was tortured here at Mount Misery. Now Donald Rumsfeld owns Mount Misery, you know, known for torture himself. And what do you make of this? And she said, I can't comment right now. We're in church. So from Mount Misery to Mount Hope, I was speaking in upstate New York near Rochester. And at the end of the talk, a young woman student came up to me and said, can I take you to Mount Hope Cemetery? I'd like to show you Frederick Douglass's gravestone. And it was a snowy day, another climate change night, massive snowstorm. I had to race out the next morning to Denver at about six in the morning. I said, well, if you meet me at five in front of the cemetery, she said, I'll be there. And we trudged through the snow and wiped off the snowflakes of Frederick Douglass's tombstone. And she said, please, come with me across the cemetery. I have one more grave to show you. We slided our way across the cemetery, and there was this tombstone of Susan B. Anthony. Susan B. Anthony. 
and Frederick Douglass, they were not just allies, they were friends. When I gave this talk at Wesleyan University and described this, a woman said to me, and did you go near Susan B. Anthony's house because there is a statue not of a general but of Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass having tea together. See, Frederick Douglass was not just an abolitionist, he was a great feminist. He seconded the resolution at the Seneca Falls Convention of 1848 for women to have the right to vote. And Susan B. Anthony supported abolition, the abolition movement, the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement. These are the movements that have made this country great. Dissent is what will save us. And the media is the place with real discussions and debates to have dissent commonplace. When we make it commonplace, that will make us a greater nation, the great nation that we certainly can be. I wanted to end briefly with one last story as we talk about you graduates going out into the world. This year is the 20th anniversary of the massacre of Santa Cruz in East Timor. Some of you might not even know where East Timor is, and that wouldn't be shocking. It's because the media hardly covered it. It's not near Baltimore. It's actually about 300 miles above Australia. And in 1975, the Indonesian military invaded, armed, trained, and financed by the United States. And for the next quarter of a century, they committed one of the greatest um, genocides of the 20th century. They killed off a third of the Timorese. Um, I had a chance to go there. The Indonesian military shut the country off to the outside world for the first 17 years or so. Then because of international pressure, some people were able to get in. I got a chance to go there in 1990 and 1991. And in 1991, I was there with my colleague, a brave, courageous journalist named Alan Nairn. And it was November 12th, 1991, in the morning, a thousand people gathered for mass because they were commemorating yet another young Timorese who was killed by the Indonesian military. They gathered, gathered at the local Catholic church for mass. And then the children and the teenagers, the high school girls and boys, pulled out banners from their Catholic school blouses that they had written on bed sheets that said things like, why the Indonesian army shoot our church? and they appealed to President Bush. It was President George H.W. Bush at the time. They appealed to the United Nations. They appealed to anyone to stop the killing. And they walked through the streets of Dili, the capital of East Timor, through this geography of pain, where in every other building, whether it was a police barracks, even at the back of a hotel or an officer's residence, people were disappeared, women were raped. Uh, soldiers um, had hurt the Timorese people, so they went to the people marched a cross section of Timorese society to the cemetery where so many were buried. In this land where there was no freedom of press, no freedom of assembly, no freedom of speech, they dared to march with their hands up in the V sign. Girls in their Catholic school uniforms, old women with their traditional Timorese garb, boys with their Catholic school shorts, and old men. East Timor marched, and they marched to the Santa Cruz Cemetery. We were following them. They were risking everything. And I said, you are willing to die for this? And they'd say, for my mother, for my father, for my village, it was wiped out. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning on November 12th. They were at the cemetery. And soldiers marched up, 12 to 15 abreast. They were carrying their USM 16s at the ready position. The people couldn't get away because there were high walls on either side of the road for the cemetery. Some at the very back could run but no one could escape the front, and the soldiers marched up. Alan and I walked to the front of the crowd, because although we knew they'd committed many massacres in the past, the Indonesian military, they'd never done it in front of Western journalists. Maybe just our presence could head off the attack. I always hid my equipment. Any, any Timorese caught talking to us could be taken away or disappeared, but now I wanted to make clear who we were. I held up my microphone like a flag, slung my radio cassette over my uh, arm. Alan put the camera above his head, and we marched to the front. We walked to the front of the crowd. The soldiers marched up, 10 to 12 abreast. They swept around the corner, past us, and without any warning or hesitation, without any provocation, they opened fire on the crowd, gunning the Timorese down, the first to go down a little boy with his hands up in the V sign, and they just kept killing. 
We were taken down by the Indonesian soldiers. They beat me to the ground. Alan got a photograph of them opening fire. He threw himself on top of me to protect me. And the group of soldiers put the guns to our heads and they started screaming two things. They came into a firing squad line. They were screaming two things, politique and Australia. Politique, they were saying we were political to witness this, but that is our job as journalists, to go to where the silence is. And they were shouting, Australia, demanding to know if we were from Australia. We knew what that meant. When Indonesia invaded Timor 17 years before, there were six Australian-based journalists covering the invasion for the world. They took the first five of them, lined them up, and executed them. The last one, Roger East, was in a radio station in Dili reporting for the world, December 8th, 1975. And as he shouted, I'm from Australia, when the Indonesian soldiers got him, they shot him into the harbor. The Australian government hardly protested the killing of their journalists. We believe because years later, Indonesia and Australia would sign the Timor Gap Treaty, dividing Timor's oil between Australia and Indonesia. Oil is the source of so much pain in the world. We were able to escape the massacre site. The soldiers beat Allen with their USM-16s until they fractured his skull. But a Red Cross Jeep pulled up. We were able to get into it. Dozens of Timorese jumped on top of us, on top of the vehicle. We drove like that as a human mass to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, the doctors and nurses started to cry when they saw us. Not because we were in worse shape than the Timorese. We were not. They were unbelievably brave. We had brothers and sisters dragging their loved ones to the hospital, the lucky ones who had survived. They killed more than 250 Timorese on that day, one, not one of the larger massacres. But when the doctors and nurses saw us, they cried. Because I think of what we represent to the people of Timor, and not just Alan and me, but all of us as Americans in this country, to the people not just of Timor, but all over the world, I think we represent two things, the sword and the shield. The sword, because all too often the US government uses those weapons or provides them to a repressive regime that abuses human rights. But the shield, because the American people, people turn to all over the world because we can just make a phone talk to a congressman. When they march, they are gunned down. That we have this awesome responsibility at the trigger end of foreign policy to make a difference. And they saw that shield bloodied that day and it just deepened their despair. We did get out, made our way to the United States, held a press conference in the National Press Club, and made the connection that this massacre, which hadn't, this massacre had been carried out with US weapons. A nationwide movement grew up in this country, not only to stop arming the Indonesian military, but to stop arming human rights regimes around the world. And in 1999, the people of Timor got to vote for their freedom in a UN referendum. And it was a remarkable day when they voted. Three years later, I got a chance to go to Timor when the newest nation in the world was founded, the Democratic Republic of East Timor. And it was amazing. It was midnight. Then Kofi Annan, the Secretary General of the United Nations, got up, gave his speech. And then the founding president of East Timor, Shanana Gushmao, got up and he unfurled the flag of the Democratic Republic of East Timor. He had been imprisoned by the Indonesian military for years. It was a remarkable movement. 100,000 Timorese had come to celebrate the establishment of this country. You could see the tears, the light of the fireworks display reflected in their tear-stained faces. And they thanked people all over the world for helping them, for their solidarity, especially people in the Western, most powerful countries for telling their government to stop funding, financing, and arming the regimes that are killing civilians. And it is such an important lesson to us all. Here was this nation of survivors. They had prevailed, but an unbelievably high price, but they had won. It is a lesson to all of us, whether we are journalists or deans, provosts, farmers, whether we are students, whether we will be or are lawyers now, whether we are artists, whether we are employed or unemployed, we have a decision to make every day, every hour of every day, and that is whether to represent the sword or the shield. Democracy Now!